Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with bladesmith and blacksmith Ed Soule. Ed was introduced to me by a friend of the show who knew that a recent collaboration knife of his would speak my love language. He was right. But when I looked further and I saw a man with a passion and talent for metal with a forged in fire pedigree, I had to know more. So here, we're going to talk about it. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show and check out all sorts of interview extras, like the extra conversation we have with Ed Sol after this main interview, please go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check us out there. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Ed, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh man, it's a it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, uh, so you did me a solid and sent this out for me to check out. This is a recent collaboration. Um, you got to tell me about this because I've never seen a knife quite like this, and I've shown this off a bit on the podcast and on Thursday Night Knives. So people are probably familiar with the brain shovel. Tell me yes. about this. Um. Basically, I'm apprenticing with Todd Hunt, um, fantastic knife maker, awesome human being. I can't say enough things about him. Um, but we, every once in a while, we'll do a collaboration with, between, where we both work on a project. And um, he said, "We hey, we should do a dagger. I, I think we should do something fun. And I'm like, if we're going to do a dagger, why don't we do a push dagger? And we were talking about it. We never liked that T shape that most daggers have for a handle. Um, I feel it's very limiting, and it basically you have to have a specific type of hand for it to be comfortable in. And we just thought we could honestly, we thought we could do it better. Um, Todd makes a thing called a ring pop, which is basically a knuckle duster with spikes. And I asked, hey, um, if we take your handle and we just basically put a dagger on it, like, would you be offended? Because I love your, I love your knock. You can hold it, you know, thirty different ways. It's amazing. He's like, "Yeah, let's do that." And as we were prototyping it, um, I heard through the grapevine about a, you know, this amazing steel called Apex Ultra, and I was like, "This would be perfect. Like, it's the hardest, the highest toughness at the highest hardness, which is sixty-seven Rockwell, mm. and it's like off the chart tough, and." super fine grain structure like it's just meant for straight razors abuse like it was a perfect dagger uh steel and i got some and basically you know tracked it down i got some and we just made the best punch dagger we could think of is a short version and it's super comfortable and like i said it's just awesome so how did you work with the um apex ultra i know you uh, from Forged in Fire, but did, is this a steel that you forge, or how did, how did you guys work with this incredibly yes. hard steel? So it's meant to be forged. Um, unfortunately, I like abuse, so I um, I got it in a bar stock so we could just, you know, cut it out and shape it to what we needed to. So um, we first thing we did was we took the bar, we made a bunch, drew the, you know, traced our blank on it, and then we took it to a metal worker, which is basically an industrial machine for punching holes in this thick steel. And uh, we broke it. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Even in its softened state, Apex Ultra is super tough. So we basically we killed the metal worker and we snapped the bar a few times. So then we just went old school, just drilled, and drilled the holes, did everything by hand. And because... Um, which realistically we should have forged it and punch and drifted the holes, mm -hmm. but we just tried doing it, like I said, ma manufacturing it to make them all identical. Cause when you forge it, 
you know, things are never the same. Like you can get close. And one of the things I'm learning from Todd is repeatability. And you want everything to be as identical as possible. Because, you know, if two people have the same knife, you want it to be the exact same knife. Not like, oh, look, mine's a little bit bigger than yours. Ha, ha, ha. So, um, yeah. So we basically just did it all stock removals um, and suffered for it. So <laughs> then we're talking about the next batch and how we're going to use the forge to do it hot to make our lives that much easier. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, is there a, um, is there something that you want to get out of apex ultra in this knife in particular, or is it just uh, a value added, you know, look at this exotic steel you're getting when you buy this. Um, it's really, it's about the best product possible. Uh, we joked around the shop that if you got into a knife fight, somebody has a Walmart knife, you could literally punch and break the knife with the brain <laughs> shovel. It's yeah. that much tougher than anything else out there. Um, okay. So before we get to what is a knuck, because some people might just be listening and might not uh, see what I have in my hand. It's a, uh, it's a dagger, uh, a short stout dagger of about two and a half inches. Um, and then at the base of it, there's a large circle and on either side, um, is a buttress that attaches to a handle. So it's kind of like a knuckle duster, a single knuckle knuckle duster, but tell me about Nux and, and how, how you sort of thought that this would be the right platform for a dagger. Um, I've helped, uh, like I said, Todd makes the ring pop, which is yep. the yep. the knuckle duster, or his version of it. And I've held a lot of them as I help, you know, help him finish him, putting the handles on them, finishing the handles. And every time I held it, I just really like the way it feels in your hand. And then we were playing around with, like I said, uh, pu push daggers. And like every shape we drew out and traced out just didn't feel as good. And then I've got famously small hands, so anything he held and he liked, I didn't. Anything I liked, he said, felt like a little girl's toy. <laughs> um, so finally, I'm like, you know what? Let's just go with the ring pop. We both love it, and that's better than you know the 15 drawings we have that we that we're both criticizing each other about. And he's like, you know what? That's a great idea. <laughs> so we did it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, I have slender fingers, um, and this still feels comfortable if you take that traditional uh, center line grip uh, for this push dagger. But actually, I find it most comfortable like this, right on the forefinger. Um, and and with that lanyard you put in there yeah. or on there, it it it's a it's a great grip. And then it's got this beautiful beautiful leather sheath. Uh, that drops in your pocket, and then yep. it only leaves just a little bit uh, hanging out of your pocket. Yep, and that's another thing is, you know, you're carrying something that's basically meant for self-defense, and you don't, we try to find a way that you could comfortably carry it and not advertise that you're basically carrying a dagger or, you know, a self-defense weapon. So you can, like I said, you tuck it in your pocket, or you can put it on the inside of your jeans, so just the little clips hanging out. Mm -hmm. Very comfortable um, every way I've tried to wear it. And like I said, it just looks like a little accent piece around your waist. Nobody says anything. Nobody's threatened. But at the same time, if you need it, it's there. Yeah, and and all of, uh, well, this handle is, I forgot to ask you, is this Coca Bolo or what kind of wood is no, it? No, it is actually a dyed curly maple. It's beautiful. And... Um, all the other handles uh, on the website are beautiful as well. Um, so that's that's a benefit. You've got a, a real weapon type thing here, but it's beautiful and confusing. You know, yes. <laughs> someone will look at, oh, oh, you know, that's interesting. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. I'm sort of menaced, but it's so <laughs> beautiful that, yeah. you know what I mean? So that that's definitely something that struck me. Uh, when you sent this to me, you also sent, uh, oh, it's just out of reach. You also sent me another uh, knife of your making, a, a straight blade uh, hunting knife, yep. uh, a a beautiful thing. So tell me, let's let's get into how you got into knife making and how you got into metal. Take us all the way back. <laughs> um, so I've, uh, it's been, so basically I started off wanting to be a woodworker and just for whatever reason i was just in a place in my life where i got fed up with video games apparently i matured a little bit so i was just going down the youtube rabbit hole and i was just watching people whittle and 
make you know carving wood spoons mm -hmm. and all sorts of basic you know hand, you know things that were hand carved and my wonderful wife the same being being the same she is says hey ed you know there's a down in franklin indiana there's this awesome woodland convention do you want to go and i'm like that sounds amazing so we packed up the kids and drove down there and it was all oohs and ahs and while i was there this guy just i guess saw the look of a deer in the headlights he's like come on over like have you done any woodworking i'm like none he's like well what do you want to do and i'm like i want to make spoons and spatulas he's like dude you need these two tools and this book 100 bucks you're ready to go and i was like dude 100 bucks i'm in so he's like oh by the way i made i made the two little wood you know the wood carving tools that's why the handles are a little iffy but here you go they're going to be great and i was like still 100 bucks i'm in and they were absolutely fantastic and as i wanted to go more into woodworking i just went to home depot and i was like oh a chisel's a chisel a, you know nice and knife bottom and they were hot garbage like i could not sharpen them every time i was using i was spending more time sharpening than using and i was like i'm just gonna go online buy the best you know wood chisels that are out there and just you know call it a day right and I go on it's like a lee valley sweetheart or something and like each chisels 350 bucks and you need a set of five to get them mm. i was like there's no way for the price of two chisels i can buy all the tools i need and i can make my own and i did i, I bought an anvil I, I bought a forge and then i just as i was learning how to you know move metal i just fell in love with knives so that's basically how, how I got into it. That's it's my wife's fault. That's amazing. It's not. Uh, it's not your average uh, lady or wife who will say, "Hey, there's a whittling convention, um, yeah. you know, in the next state. Let's go." That's that is that is really cool. I mean, um, well, hats off to her, indeed. Um, so it's interesting that uh, you were brought to metal through wood, um, you know, to to two components that go into lots of different knife making, uh, but, yes. but, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, well, two very different uh, materials to work with, yeah. let's say. Um, oh, sure. uh, but, but it was the steel. And, and I also uh, know that you do some cooking or did some cooking, right? Yes. So that did that deepen your attachment? Yes. That um, it's one of those things everybody says work with what you know and you love and I'm Hispanic believe it or not dad had a thing for blonde blood women hence the good looks <laughs> but I spent my whole life in the kitchen with my grand with one of my grandmothers basically all day every day you know helping to make food either for that day or also on my father's side every Saturday was a big family lunch and my poor grandmother couldn't do it so I'd go over there Friday and you know, Friday after school, and we'd start cooking for you know Sunday lunch. And then, as she got older, she would you know she wanted to take more cooking classes, but she can't drive at night because you know yeah. she's old and it's dark. So I would take her, and then I would you know obviously if I'm taking her, you know we both signed up for cooking classes, and that's just one way we bonded. So I love to cook, and that just informed me on like my knives. I focus to make a single purpose tool the best that i can and i like slicey things so all my knives are very slicey being a kitchen knives the utility knives they're all like i said they're just fantastic slicers because that's what i know so how, how did you make the leap first of all i think that's a beautiful story uh, I, I was close with both of my grandmothers um and the idea of taking a cooking class uh, with, with your grandmother is i love that um but uh, so how did that how did it come to pass that you're like you're cooking you're cooking and suddenly or not suddenly but you decide none of these knives are doing it for me i need to make my own um well that's the thing is again i grew up not knowing what i don't know so every knife that you buy you buy it from walmart or wherever for 20 bucks and then as you go through well this one's kind of garbage or i like this i'll look at other knives like similar to that but not exactly the same and I mean, we were like, I kid you not, we were going through a knife, you know, Walmart knife every 90 days between the two of us. Like we just, we would, and again, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. And we'd be very aggressive with our sharpening. Yeah. And you know, you're processing meat because again, you're feeding a Mexican family of 30. 
like you're going to sharpen that bad boy a lot. Yeah. And just, we would just fly through knives like, well, this one's garbage. Abuelita, what did you like? I'm, I'm going to Walmart to buy whatever. I'm going to buy us a couple extra knives. He's like, well, I like the German, you know, the German style chefs. Try this, try that, avoid that. And um, long story short, like my chef knives, like I've got one that I'm working on right here. Like this was in a cooking class that we took. I, I wish I remember who made it, but um, it was this similar to shape and we both loved it. My grandmother tried to buy it off the guy that was giving us the cooking class and he said no. And um, it just sat in the back of my head for 20 plus years. And then when I started making knives again, I defaulted to French chefs, German chefs. And then I was, you know, refining my design. I was like, hey, I remember that one knife. And then, you know, got on, you know, got on WhatsApp, called my, my you know, called Abuelita. I was like, hey, Abuelita, do you remember that one? It's like, oh my gosh, I, Eddie, I've been looking for that for 30 years. If you find one, you let me know and you buy like 20 of them because I don't know if they're going to go out of business or what. And I'm like, well, Grandma, I kind of make knives now. She's like, well, you get good at it. And then huh. you can send me one. Ah, yes. Like, I don't want the first one. I want like the 50th. Preach. I love that. You know, grandma, like, don't, yeah. don't, you don't make me stronger by not sparing my feelings. <laughs> um, so do you remember, I mean, you're talking about cycling through um, Walmart knives. There was a period of time, a long period of time, started with Ginsu where everything yeah. cheap was serrated. Yes. Um, figuring that these people never sharp sharpen our, their knives before they throw it out and come back to Walmart and get a new one. Yep. Um, how did you do, you, did you have those knives and, and how did you uh, deal with them? Uh, we would just basically sharpen the serrations off the knife. Like I, I now have an absolute hatred of serrations <laughs> because of that. Yeah. In my, in my, my current philosophy is unless you're in the military and your knife, de your life depends on the knife cutting through that piece of rope to save you. You don't need serrations. Get off that. You get off your high horse. Sharpen your knife. All right. Like we're done. Yeah. No doubt. Well, for me, I like them on uh, like like you're talking tactical knives and stuff yeah. like that. But on a kitchen knife, there is no place, no place for that. So that leads me to geometry. You know, um, I got my first. Uh, I have two custom kitchen knives from the same maker, and I got them both within the year. And it's amazing to me that even when they're dull. Um, they cut better than yeah. uh, some of my, you know, Vostoff or like the expensive knives that I have. Um, so how do you approach um, the the edge geometry and, and the geometry of the blade? You said that each knife has a specific uh, use or purpose. Do you vary uh, how you grind them and what the geometry is per use? Yes. So um, basically going back to sliceability, which has kind of been my focus. I like very thin, very agile blades where there's less, you know, basically is here's, you know, here's the sharp bits. The more you close it and get it thinner, the easy, the less friction there is when you're slicing through things. So I tried to make my blades literally as thin as I can close to the bottom. And then about halfway up, it'll kind of flare out a little bit more. And that'll kind of give you that resistance you need to like, you know, get food release, things like that. But as close to the edge as you can, you want it laser thin. And that's what sets, I feel like sets my knives apart is I like steels that have very fine grain structures that are going to hold a thinner, sharper edge longer. And that's basically what I shoot for. Well, what steels are those? I, I'm, I'm sure you don't use the Apex <laughs> Ultra on the, on the, uh... No, I'm going to though. I, I, oh. I do have a couple pieces of Apex Ultra that are set aside to forge some chef knives. But um, my, my go to steel specifically are in high carbon is 52100 mm -hmm. and AEBL stainless are my two. Fa I mean, I use anything the customer wants, but those are the two that I use the most because they are known for their very fine grade structure. And you can get them just crazy thin. 52100 isn't that the the nasa ball bearing steel yes that's oh, exactly I mean, right how cool is that <laughs> and it's and it's awesome because again since they're in ball bearings like i i have chunks so between indianapolis and chicago there is the i think it is actually the world's biggest wind farm oh. so i can just call up there and be like hey guys um by any chance are you swapping out the bearings on anything and if so can i just 
swing by with a buck. Like, I will give you beer for your old ball bearings. And they're like, uh, yeah, just don't come on Thursdays because that's when the supervisor's here. But any other day, just call this number, say, ask for, you know, I'm not going to give the guy's name, but ask for so-and-so, and I like Coors Light. Wow, that is so, so I, cool. So that, how big are those bearings? I mean, um, they're enormous. Like the oh rings are about, shoot, I'm trying to get in the middle of the camera, but they're about as big as my head. Wow. Yeah. That's, and that's you pretty just, cool. And I cut them in, in the, like, it's a sliver. Like one of those bearings will make 20 plus knives. And then, uh, and then, okay. So, so I would imagine, so if you start making, um, okay, my, my brain is get a, getting ahead of me for, kitchen knife making yes. i would imagine that the forging process unless you buy plates of steel that are very very thin the forging process is going to be more efficient and maybe an easier way for you to get to uh, a real thin stock to start with is that right yes so that and yes so basically again you have the giant ring uh and it's about that thick so about four inches wide is how thick the bearing is I'll cut a you know a quarter inch uh, sliver off that whole thing, and I can just heat it up. And from there, I've got a beautiful starting position to draw out the tang, make the blade, and it's uh, I've got a hydraulic press and a tire hammer, so it's like it takes me less than a beer to get the rough shape in. So, okay, so your knife making skills and capabilities really did come out of a a blacksmithing uh, yes. beginning, right? Yes. What is what is the difference? I forget that there is a difference, uh, but uh, until I see them next to each other. Um, so, I mean, between uh, blade smithing and stock removal. Well, no, 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 no. Blacksmithing no, and bladesmithing. Yeah, isn't a blacksmith also, a, or isn't yes. a bladesmith also a blacksmith? Or yes. So work? the basically the umbrella would be blacksmithing, which is basically heating up steel and hitting it. And then a subset of that would be bladesmithing. So there's all these skills that encompass making things out of pot steel. And then just a portion of that is bladesmithing. So again, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I started learning all of the basics and I have a pretty big tool set that now when I need to make something or teach somebody how to do something else, I know how to do it because I'm self-taught and I, I went to YouTube university and learned how to do it. <laughs> That's the best university out there yeah. these days. Um, so a, a, a blacksmith is someone who makes tools or art Tool, with... Yes, tools, decorative, uh, staircases, scroll work. Um, they were basically the go-to guy of the Old West. For example, they make S... The, the, I don't know if you've heard of the S-hooks. It's yeah. just a steel S. It's called a cowboy duct tape. Uh, because that you use it for everything. Yeah. You need to make it something close. You need to get your pot closer to the fire, add a couple S hooks, get it lower. Things getting too hot. You take a couple S hooks out, get it away from the fire. Your chain doesn't reach to you know wrap it around something. Add a couple S hooks. You know, yeah. it's used for everything. And that's one of the things I love about blacksmithing is it you don't know how, how useful it was because it did everything like you couldn't go to the you know you couldn't go to the store and buy it you had to call up the guy and be like hey can you make me xyz and then have him work you work you into his schedule yeah chances are you didn't call him at all chances yeah, you are should, you yeah. <laughs> yeah you walked over there <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh uh i i love the idea of a community blacksmith community yeah. knife maker um, I know in Japan, uh, that's a that's always been a tradition, you know. Yeah. Uh, as well, I'm sure everywhere that uses metal, but the idea of also having a knife maker, yeah. someone particular. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm in rural Indiana, so the amount of farmers that just drop by, I'm like, "Hey, can you weld this thing back together?" And it's like, "Yeah, like let's do it. Let's throw it. In. I, I've got a ginormous forge." that's open on both ends just so I can put farm equipment in from both sides wow. to get it hot enough to forge weld itself back together. I sharpen lawnmower blades that are big, you know, like industrial sized lawnmower blades, or I don't even know what it is, but it's a, it's a lawnmower blade on steroids. I sharpen those three, four times a week. Like just every guy's like, Hey Ed, can you, can I borrow your shop for 20 minutes or an hour? I need this done. I need that done because it's one of those things, like I said, and they'll show up and they'll give me beef. They'll pay me in eggs. They'll pay oh me. Oh my god! Pain. How like, cool! I've, yeah, 
So, so that is you. You are the yeah. community blacksmith. <laughs> I am the guy. And, and it's still relevant. That's yeah. amazing. I love that because, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't grow up in a farming community. I don't know from farming, but I love the idea that all of that stuff has to be, you know, eventually it all has to be fixed. Yeah. And, you know, I guess you could send it back to the manufacturer or you could go down the street to the blacksmith. Yeah. So, like I said, so the, like, the, I don't even know what it is, but it's one of the structural beams. Like, they bolted off a tractor or harvest or whatever. And it was like $9,000 to mail it back, get it fixed, and then have them mail the exact same one back. God. Or they brought it to my shop and gave me, you know, a couple, you know, a, you know, a couple six packs and two dozen eggs. And we heated it up. I made a what's called a scarf weld, where it's basically hooks onto each other like this, and just you know made it, made sure it fit. It was dry fit. Then we put in the forge, you know, baptized it in flux, got it white hot, hit it a few times with a hammer, let it cool down, sprayed it with barbecue high temp spray paint for him, put it back on the track, the harvester, and he finished harvesting corn. It took him two hours, which could have been would have been three weeks that he couldn't use the tool. If you'd have shipped it off, that's pretty amazing. I wonder how many, um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of knife makers, obviously, yeah. some of them forge, and uh, I, I wonder how many people could bend their uh, their shop to do such a thing. It's a it's a great idea to me. Um, also, probably a great way to make extra cash as a knife maker. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but I love that. I, I I think I have a lot of nostalgia for times I didn't in places I didn't grow up in. And that to me, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's cool. Uh, another concept similar to that, <coughs> excuse me, that is also very interesting to me and is something I, I really hope we all go move back towards a lot more than we are right now is apprenticeships. Now we were talking before about your apprenticeship with Todd Hunt, uh, custom knife maker, TM yes. Hunt. Um, tell me about that. And, and, like how you see the benefit, what the benefits of apprenticing are and how this oh, is working for you. It's been amazing. Like it's, it has changed my knife making career. Um, like I said, I was self-taught and thankfully, like I said, um, I have a very supporting family and my wife gets it. So she's let me say, I can call, I mean, as long as the kids are home and everyone's fed, I'm like, Hey, sweetie, I want to drive to, you know, I want to drive to Kentucky. I want to drive to Pennsylvania for the weekend. I'll be back Sunday. I'll let you know when I get there and just hang out in people's shops to learn. And it's like I said, it's always been somewhere far away. But then um, I, I, I stumbled across Todd Hunt, who is literally in Seymour, which is about an hour away from me. Fantastic. I said, fantastic knife maker. I kept trying to like reach out. It's like, hey, buddy, you're only an hour away. Like, again, can't you know let me be a fly on the wall can i come over can i hang out can i you know i'll bring mexican food like you'll love it let me just let me hang out and pick your brain but he's a productive production knife shop he doesn't have the time and then um he moved out of his home shop into a bigger facility and was at the point i mean he's very like i said he's he's earned it but he's at the point where he can he needs help making his knives to um uh, basically to meet the demand that's out there for his product. So he needed help from someone. So I was like, and I, the second he said that, I was like, dude, it's me. Just let me, just let me come over. I'm not a psychopath. I swear. And uh, basically he, he had me over one day, uh, interviewed me, had me bring my work because, you know, he didn't want, I mean, he needed somebody, but he didn't have the time to train them. So he's like, even if they're halfway decent, I can bring them up to where I need them to be. And then, so I brought all my knives and he, thankfully they were better than he expected. So the, 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 the bar wasn't too low, but yes. So he's like, Hey, you know how to use all the tools. Um, I love your creativity. All you need is practice. And uh, my goal is to teach you to make my knives and bring, you know, your game from here up to here. This is where I need you to be. And that's what we've been working on. Like I said, I uh, learned uh, grinding techniques, finishing techniques, ways to be more productive when I'm making my batches of knives, you know, things I should be focusing on, areas to, like I said, it's just, it's been, a, he's been an absolute blessing in my life. Like it's just really been amazing. I'm very grateful to him and uh, Spencer, who was also down there. 
Uh, definitely your perseverance got you in, though. And, and that's something people need to remember, yeah. especially today with uh, people, especially maybe younger people who are not as comfortable with other people. Yes. Um, uh, you, you really have to be persistent. And uh, people recognize that. I mean, I, I tell my, my daughters this all the time, you know, uh, you, you, you're very persistent when you want ice cream or when yes. you want to watch something or whatever. You need to be that persistent about what you want out, out there in life because uh, eventually you'll annoy people like you annoy me and they'll <laughs> give in. <laughs> Um, I heard a fantastic quote that I've really been, that really resonated with me. It's, and it's the magic you're looking for is in the work you're avoiding. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, and it's, you know, like if you look at Brian House, uh, hard work leads to good luck. Like it's as long as you keep, you know, doing what you need to be doing, you're going to get there. Like, and it's. Yeah. That's the beauty of the apprenticeship is I have the drive. I just didn't have know where my destination was. And Todd has been there like, we need to get you to here. Here's how we're going to get there. And that's the beauty of the apprenticeship is as long as you put in the effort and actually listen to the advice given, you're going to get better. Yeah. And like I said, it's I'm, I'm set up just happy, just blessed to have them in my life. It is uh, apprenticeship is truly yes. uh, 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 um, uh, what's that was symbiotic because yes. uh, he he needs someone and he yes. needs someone good and he needs to make that person good in his own image, so to speak. And you need to become good for your own work and and also to do a good job for him. So everyone benefits. Let's yes. let's talk about your knives. Um, OK, uh, what? Uh, you just showed me that kitchen knife. Hold hold that back up for a second, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so th there, I love the, uh, first of all, the blade shape is pretty interesting. It reminds me a little bit of what I've seen from uh, Vietnam, Vietnam uh, style kitchen knives. But I love that uh, nice circular choil you have to lock your finger in yes. uh, right there at the Ricasso. Um, this is a, this is a, Beautiful knife. I'm I'm loving this. Yeah, and like I said, it's just it's been repetition. Uh, for example, they used to be a lot thicker, but now if you look at it, um, I mean, it's just razor thin. Oh, yeah. And then you added the finger. At, at some point, I it's like I don't like how I'm holding it. I want to get the a finger choil, so now everything gets that finger choil, and it's just got that beautiful pinch grip. So when you hold it, it's got a contoured uh, contoured handle. That just leads to that pinch grip and it's like i said it's surprisingly light which is again another benefit um because it, i mean obviously us home cooks we're not going to be processing veg for eight to ten hours right but there are people who are out there and again wanting to make the best tool possible if i can make it that much lighter why not just again make it the best tool and if chefs out there dig it then you know that's that's only a benefit and it's and it's gotten to the point where i go to chef, I, same thing i go to chefs i go to professional kitchens i'm like hey you know can i talk to you one morning get your opinion on things as i was starting and they that was one of the things that they brought out is it needs to be light it needs to just be as thin as humanly possible and just you know something i can use all day and i don't i don't feel the carpal tunnel after a couple hours because it's such a big heavy chonker which again if you buy those big you know like again going back to Wustoffs and cutco knives yeah um they're just really thick and heavy because they only have a grind about you know a third of the way up and then it's three sixteenths at the spine i mean it's i mean um for example in my household i know i need to sharpen our kitchen knives because my wife grabbed the cutco so that's that's the red flag right there. It's like, uh oh, yeah, I, yeah, need, yeah. I need, I need, I'll be right back, baby. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that to yourself. I'll be yeah. right back. Um, so, is the heat treatment uh, very much different when you're making a kitchen knife? I, I, I imagine you want since you're cutting against wood, and I would imagine you want a somewhat high um, uh, Rockwell hardness. Yes. But at the same time, you know, in a kitchen, you're banging into other metal and you're doing stuff and scraping and stuff you also don't want it to be too brittle how do you handle yeah. the the heat treatment for kitchen um, work testing the answer is testing um my wife although she's very supportive of my knife making she doesn't get it one bit she's like you, you charge how much for these things <laughs> like really people pay you for that i'm like honey the mortgage is paid baby like it works 
<laughs> so she is the best person to hand something to be destroyed. Because I will give her, I will give her a knife. I'm like, here, honey, just use it. Let me know what you think. And dude, zero f's given. Like it, it goes in, the, it goes in the dishwasher. Oh yeah. She just <laughs> slams it in the drawer. Or heck, I like I've it, like again. I understand it's her family, her family thing. They love to chuck things. So she'll just yell at our kids, "Hey, open the knife drawer!" And she'll just chuck the the, the kitchen color. And I'm like, I'm like, honey, that's <laughs> expensive. Yeah, I'm gonna sell that. Like, like a little bit of love. And she's like, no. She's like, you asked me to test it. This is what I do with our kitchen. I was like, this is why they're all banged up. This is why we don't have nice things. Well, actually, that she's doing you a huge favor because yeah. that's how chefs, that's how professional kitchens yeah. are too. It's like everything's metal. Like, uh, you know, the the kitchens I worked in, uh, the Bain Marie, everything's metal there. And then the table, and then you just have yep. a cutting board and then you're done cutting you. I, I was a yeah. prep. I was a, I did tons and tons of veg, veg prep. And I used to, yeah. you know, yeah. So that was it. So I've just been, as I practice, because again, um, you just keep fine tuning your your heat treat recipe. Um, specifically, like fifty two one hundred has a multi step process to get the most out of it. Um, so you have to do three sets of normalizing and grain reduction. A three, you know, it's fifteen minutes soaks at three different temperatures, and it's a whole. And you have to let it come down to a certain temperature before you ramp it up to the next one. So it's a whole thing. But once I've, but again, I've got time. So. Um, one knife out of every batch, I'll just do it slightly different. And then it's, mm. you know, when it's done, it goes into testing. And then after six weeks of abuse by my family, if there's no dings or scratches or anything, I'm like, oh, okay, this works. Do I like it better than what I'm currently doing? Yes, no. And if I do like it better, well, everything else gets done that way. And if not, well, what can I do differently on the next one to try to bring everything up? And that's that like, for that's how you do it. That's a that's a pretty um, meticulous process. I I admire it, and uh, you know that kind of process does take a little bit of discipline. Um, yeah. Sometimes creative people t can be impulsive, and and uh, but it's interesting to see how creative people can also become scientists. You know, when they're doing something they love, like you know, like knife well, making. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty about having ADHD. Is I ha when I have something something grabs my interest i hyper focus on it and i consume the knowledge like at an increased rate so i'm always excited to, to see how i can do better like now i'm at the point where if something's heat treated and like the belt you know the belt grinder grabs it checks it into the wall of the concrete i don't care i know the tip's fine like no, people are always like oh cringe it's gonna be broken i've snapped 50 plus blades at this point just to see what the grain looked like i know if it got shot across the room the tip's fine. Like, why yeah. worry? It, dude, it, it, if it's shooting knives across the room, like the last thing I'm worried about is the tip of the knife. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's more like, where is the tip of the knife? So um, with the with your process, um, when you acquire steel, are, are you are you someone who goes out? I mean, I know that you get the 52100 from... Uh, from the wind farm and stuff like that but is yeah. that how you get all your stuff minus the apex ultra are you um it, it depends if i can find a recycled version of it to use and i don't have to worry about like micro fractures or things like that i will do it that way but honestly the best way to get aebl for example is to buy it out of bar stock i just haven't found something that's out there in a large enough quantity that i can then process to my needs but um, a lot of, uh, for example, um, my my farrier rafts that I use for tomahawks, um, those are made out of a version of 1095. I have a, a farrier out of West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I basically pay him in beer to spend the extra 20 cents to get an American-made file that I bait. I called the manufacturer, like, hey, I need to know what steel this is that you're using for this, you know, because I'm a blacksmith. And basically, I told him that I want my farrier friend to use his he basically said, I have a guy that's going to be your customer if you tell me what's in them. And they're like, yeah, here's the, you know, here's the steel composition. It's exactly 1095 plus, you know, 1% manganese and the 2% whatever. I was like, oh, perfect. That works. And I basically turned around and I'm like, Larry, I need you to buy these. So I was like, oh, but they're 20 cents. I'm like, dude, I'm going to give you a case of beer when you fill up a five-gallon bucket. Stop your complaining. <laughs> You're getting paid. He's like, oh, I guess so. And, it's, and I'm like, plus it's American made, you know. We're little businessmen. 
let's help this other little businessman. Mm. We all do better. And he's like, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like so, a little guilt to, yeah, to get so people motivated. Yeah. And that's how I do. And that's how I get 50, my uh, 1095. 5160, I, there's a local junk, there's a local uh, car junkyard. I should have put some railroad spikes, uh, knives, and some uh, uh, bottle openers. I'm like, hey, I'm a blacksmith here. You know, this is what I do. Can I have, you know, some 5160? And they're like, yeah, well, you know, because again, with leaf springs specifically or coil springs, you don't want them off of an old, you know, 52 truck because they're going to be micro fractures. It's been, you know, it's, the car's been run Stressed. for 50 years. It's, you know, it's trash. But the, the amount of people who try, you know, total a brand new truck is like once a week. So they're like, hey, we have this guy total the brand new truck. Like the, like the car's got 100 miles on it. Do you want the leaf springs and the coil springs? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I set them aside. Come on up, pick them up whenever you want. I'm like, all right. That's man. That's a great supply. You've you've got. Yeah. It's not. It seems like you've got your fingers kind of. You got lines in the water everywhere. Yeah. Well, uh, that's what you got to do. So. So this this leads me to, um, uh, you were on Forged and Fire as I mentioned yeah. in your intro. Did did that instinct and these uh, resources, you know, this resourcefulness, did that come in handy on the show? And tell me about your experience. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was so I. I mess. I mangled so many things while I was on the set. Like, it's like, and again, one of the things I, again, I love the show. It's so much fun to watch. I watch it like it's football. So like, you're constantly strategizing. Don't fixate on one thing. Be ready to pivot as you know as things go horribly wrong. Don't just because again, the worst thing you can do is freak out and just stop. Like you're on a clock. You got to get it done. And like, the amount of things that got effed and then fixed was this is a whole show like and then the worst part is you're like okay so this is messed up like for example i would quench the blade and then i was grinding it and i made it too short so i had to go back to the fire to draw it back out to then quench it to make sure i met specs and then you just hear david baker i was like huh that's a new way to do that i eduardo came up with a really interesting solution i'm like like don't do that to me david like 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 you're making me second guess my whole life right here so you can hear everything when you're. Oh yeah, that's the thing is because you you're hyper because they're what like fifty they may be like maybe ten feet away, but they are they're they're, they're the experts like they literally are holding your life in their hands. So every time they say something, like we would all kind of just slow down and quiet down a little bit to hear what the the conversation that's going on. Oh, they didn't talk about me. It's like okay, keep going, keep going. <laughs> but then like oh, what's Eduardo doing now? You're like. What, what am I doing? Like, 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 give me more information here, David. Like, do I need to stop? Do I need to pivot? And it was, but it was a hoot because again, so my episode was the Gaucho's Revenge, is uh, what 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 it was called, and it was really funny because like they, during the interview, like I go by Ed's Ed because it's easier for, to say than Eduardo Jose. So they're like, oh, well, we like Eduardo. We're gonna call Eduardo. Is that okay, Eduardo? I'm like, that's fine. Call me what you want as long as I get on TV. Like I'm in. And uh, long story short, they fly me out there and it's Eduardo this, Eduardo that. And I'm like, that's kind of like, why? Like, why are they suffering to say my name right? I get on the set and I just see sarapes, sombreros, a wood fence. Oh I'm like, my son God. of a gun. They called, in the, they called in the white Mexican as a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and then like, and they're like, and the guy, uh, Grady was there with the hay in his mouth. I'm like, dude, this is going to be the most racist episode of Forged and Fire. <laughs> And like I said, then the second they pulled that tarp and I saw that gouch, I was like, "Oh, like I got this. This is this is this is mine to lose." So a gaucho, what is that? Uh, they had the first knife was a gaucho's knife, so it was basically uh, sand my construction. So it was uh, hard uh, steel in the middle, and then two soft steels on the side. But it is basically like a very large chef knife. It's thicker. Okay, that's what I thought. That's yeah. meant to be used out in the field for. But gauchos are the, basically the Argentinian cowboys, and they use those knives for literally from cooking to skinning the animals to cutting through rope. It's their it's their Swiss Army knife. It's one like I said, it's like a usually like nine ten inch uh, chef knife like blade, and it's just like I said, it's just the way you heat treat. The heat treat is what's different on the gauchos. I think of it as a giant kitchen knife is the best way to put it because that's what it looks like. It looks like a tri triangular 
chef knife, just oversized. And Those they remind me a lot of uh, French fighting knives yes. from I don't know, eighteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century. Uh, that that also look like chef's knives, yeah. and where they famously use the the width of the blade as the guard, you know, so yeah. You, yeah. Um, which which is efficient, and it also creates a really broad blade that if you're using it um, to slice and to cut and to do these kind of things around uh, the camper in the field, it's very efficient. And if you're yes. using it to to stab into someone, you're making a big hole. So I mean, they're yeah. they're very efficient tools. Uh, but but look very pedestrian in yes. a way. Yes. So it how did you do on that? I made it to the finals. So um, basically, at the very end, they give you the sort the, the the final challenge you have to make. And I asked, "Cause hey, can I see the blade? Because I want to, you know, in my mind, take measurements to then make that exact blade. Because if I make the blade you hand me." it's going to be perfect. Right. So they bring out the blade and I'm measuring everything. Like I said, I'm, I, it is the curse that now everyone knows I have small girly hands because people go to my like, Oh, Ed, nice to meet you. Great. Like, Oh, I see why you lost. Yeah. Yeah. You got little hands because the handle was literally my hand plus a finger. That's how I measured the handle on the knife that David Baker made. So, when I and that's the one thing that on the on the instructions there was no criteria for the handle, it just said make a handle. So I was like, you know, if I make this, I'm good. Well, David Baker has normal size hands, but Doug Markaida has the hands of a proctologist. Oh. <laughs> so he grabs my knife, he grabs my sword, and he grabs like a three finger knife. He's got two fingers, like this third one's like pinched in, and the pinky is like way out here. And I, the second I saw him grab, it, I'm like, oh no. No, oh. but if it, it is what it is, if they did, because again, you don't, not, you're not allowed to meet the judges until after you're disqualified. And then when I went to shake their hands, like, thank you for the experience. And oh, this mammoth funny. hand just comes like just sausages. just, <laughs> And I'm like, oh my Lord. Like I've never felt like a smaller human being until Doug held my hand. Cause it's like, basically it's like when I hold my 11 year old daughter's hands, like, oh, look, it's adorable. Sweetheart. I love you be safe wow That's how big his hands like it's it, like, like it's like yes he's a trained martial artist and if one of his hands hits you like brain damage like it's enormous yeah so when i saw that i was like oh, i was like I'm, I'm going home and it was one of those things where i talked to the judge after like, like dude we would have loved to see your blade perform like it was so sturdy like it would have done so well but your handle. And I was like, listen, Dave, that ain't on me. That's on you. I mean, your <laughs> handle. Oh, man. And he's like, well, <laughs> well, yeah. sucks to be is what well, it is. I, I had a great time. How did you get involved with it? Uh, were they doing a casting call and you just. Ironically, Forge and Fire is like timeshares. They say, hey, you had a great time listening to our presentation. Could you give us the name of 10 friends that you think would enjoy uh, this presentation too? And enough people put my name down. They're like, dude, you need Ed. He's hilarious. He's going to be great TV. Give him a call. And then I had literally, I don't know, I think at this point I, I've got like over 40 of my buddies that have been on the show. I'm like, yeah, I told them to call you. <laughs> I was like, well, they called. And thankfully, we were able to work something out. And But eventually, I'm, I'm hoping to go back for a redemption episode. They had, I was supposed Ooh, to go this summer, but they never called back with a, with a, with a flight date. So. Well, they're they're pretty smart because uh, I th I believe that that show generates more uh, bladesmiths. You know, with every season, oh, there's yeah. someone who gets into it. I mean, uh, I used to work in the fashion industry on the on the production video production side, and um, we my wife and I used to watch Project Runway. Oh, and, that's another great show. Yeah, and I was like, someone needs to do this, but for knives. Yeah, and my wife's like, dream on. And so, and then you know, years later, that came out, and, well, and yeah, it's our it's, favorite. And show. it's been on for ten years at this point. They're on wow. season ten. I think they're starting to tape for season eleven. So they've already created their own fan base and the pool to then pull more knife knife yeah. makers in. Because like my kids, they're in the shop all the time. Like they love making knives. Like they make fantastic railroad spike knives they make tomahawks they make bottle openers they make little artsy pieces I that they just think are that. cool 
And at this point, I'm like, if I, especially like with my eight year old, I'm like, dude, I could sign him up now for the ABS and he could, and if just a little bit of a nudge, he could probably test for journeyman in two, three years, like just be an wow. 11 year old. Wow. And it's one of those things. But then again, on the opposite side is my wife's like, I've seen your hands. Like, we're not doing that to a small child. I'm like, <laughs> it's fine, baby. Like, it's, it's, it's like, what are scars? You know? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, I saw a really cute video on your uh, Instagram of a daughter of yours, you know, pulling, yeah. pulling a piece out of the, out of the, um, out of the forge. forge and then walking over to the power hammer. Ding, 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 ding. I was like, yeah, that is, that just warms, warms yeah. the heart. I and love that's that. what they love to do. Like they don't play like, not that I don't encourage them to be couch potatoes, but that's not something that we care about. So they, it's not really an option. So they're like, yeah, I can watch somebody do it on TV. And they're like, my dad's got a full metal in wood shop. Like I can make that. And they're like, Hey dad, um, do you want to make an X, Y, Z? And it's like, all right, let's go. You know, we make, uh, bird houses for bats. Uh, like right now, that's getting colder. We're making houses for stray cats to survive the winter. It's like whatever oh. they want. Like it's like let's go. You know, that's that's a uh, bigger gift than you might imagine, uh, or hopefully it isn't. Yeah. But I mean, that self reliance, yeah, is going to come in handy in their lifetime. And it's that self confidence because they're learning a skill and they f they're creating their own value. Because I don't want them to think that their value and validation comes from somewhere else. That's something that I struggled with personally growing up. So I know the value of you know, being self-reliant. Like they can say, Hey, I might have a hard day today, but I'm a good person. I can do X, Y, Z. And then they have those tools for later. Like my son is, he's a, he, both of my kids are angels. I love them to pieces and they have such good hearts. My son will come home with these random toys that I've never seen him hold before. And they're broken, and then he'll just kind of like, "Hey, Dad, can I borrow some super glue?" It's like, "All right," and he'll come down here, he'll grab some super glue, and he'll glue these little toys back together, and then they disappear again. I'm like, "What happened?" Oh, well, you know, you know, that was, you know, Arab's toy. Um, he broke it. His dad didn't know how to fix it, so I, I saw that he tried using this super glue, and it was the wrong thickness. So I used a combination of, you know. JB Weld, I'm like, that's actually really smart how you did that. He's like, <laughs> well, it worked, so I fixed the Arab's toy, and so I just gave it back. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And that's how they know. Like I said, that that's self worth. Nobody can take it away from. It's like I fixed my friend's toy all by myself, and that's only going to improve. Like I said, his self, you know, his confidence and his relationship with that kid. So, yeah, the the older I get, the more I see in in my peers and, and just, uh, well, I, I noticed this a lot in men, uh, women can't help, but be useful, but a men, all they really want is to be useful in yeah. some way or another. And, um, oftentimes for men, it happens to be building things or fixing yeah. things. Yeah. And, uh, that is a great way to show your, your worth, not only, you know, to other people, but to yourself, like, yeah, absolutely. like if you're down about yourself, like you said, yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how rough of a day I have. Like, I can look at my bench and I can see the things I've made with my hands. And it's like, that's the best I can do. And it's going to go out into the world. And someone's family is going to appreciate it for literally 150 years. And the reason I say 150 years is because the weakest link in my weakest link in my knife is the epoxy on the handles, which has a shell, which will only last 150 years. Really? So I'm currently experimenting with other adhesives that'll give me a longer life on my handles. So my knives will last longer. Because again, when I'm dead, I'm dead. But I want yeah. the things that I create to be out there. Try tree sap. You know, some of these old <laughs> uh, Filipino yeah. knives, they're, they're, they're banging strong and they're old, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I say that uh, half facetiously, but yeah, it's amazing. You, you don't know what, you don't know what traditional things you might return to yeah. um, that, that might, you know, lead, lead to new, new answers. What, well, first of all, I got to ask you, uh, have you heard of the Texas custom knife show in, yes. in Conroe? I'm going to be there this year. And it, 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 it's really built around guys just like you who have been on forged in fire. Um, I know it's expanded to beyond that, but that is a big, a big part of it. I, uh, are you going to go to that this year? Not this year. I, it's just not in, I just don't have the time or the budget for it, but the goal is hopefully next year. I'm 
I'm really pushing my desire slash the desire has always been there, but I'm pushing my production things again, going back to uh, Todd Hunt. He's really helped me increase my production, mm-hmm. and how much I can make per batch. So my goal is next year. Like I want to go to the Texas custom knife show. I want to go to blade show West. Those are the two big shows I want to add to my calendar, but I just have to make, you know, make enough knives to, just be able to afford to go and then hopefully because again i don't want to go to a show and then say oh i need to sell 30 knives here just to be able to afford to go home yeah i'd rather say (laughs) hey i've i've got enough money that i can get there and comfortably come home regardless if i sell a single knife yeah oh yeah yeah definitely i mean you don't you you don't want to endanger your life for something like that but but uh it it is uh i'm very excited about it it's a it seems like a really interesting uh, show and I'm excited to meet Doug Markaida and his massive yeah. hands and and <laughs> Jay Nielsen, uh, who I've had on the show before and is a, a really oh, dude, cool, he's amazing. God, he is amazing. Uh, they asked, so they asked, like, "Hey, are you a fan of the show?" When I was in, I was like, "Dude, I love everybody on the show. I am a huge Jay Nielsen fan. Like, I actually own all of his DVDs for knife making." Oh, cool. And they're like, "Dude, they're like, are you that big?" I'm like, "Listen." If you let me get on the show and Jay is my judge, like I will literally show up with a Sharpie so he can sign my man boot. Like, <laughs> that's how big of a fan I am. Like I, I love Jay. Like now that so is a fan. Yeah. Where, where, um, where do you want to see uh, Ed Saul Crafts? Like how, how do you want to evolve uh, your, um, your company? What, what are your goals? Uh, basically, like I said, I'm a very small fish in a very large ocean of knives. I just. I just want to keep being able to afford to do what I'm doing, cover my bills. Like I said, I, I'd like to grow and just expand, like just expand my lineup, um, use more exotic materials, make higher end chef knives. Like I, I love working, making Damascus, making Kumai. I want to make more, you know, more fancy stuff. Um, I'm actually starting to work on some folders, believe it. I've, I've made slip joints and I've, you have really been driving me to go back to that because it's, it is an exercise in patience to make a slip joint. <laughs> I bet. Um, but I'm also uh, with Todd. We're, we're, we're uh, going to be tackling uh, some flippers in the very near future. So that's really um, my goal is just keep chugging along, making cool things, and having people appreciate it. Like I said, I don't I don't do this to get rich. I do this to spend be able to afford to spend time with my family and you know, live comfortably in the middle of Indiana. <laughs> That's, I, I love that. And, and be the, the town blacksmith yes. and, and the, and the fixer. Yeah. Just, I, I'm, I'm slowly turning into a pillar of my community and I, it's, it's nice. I like that feeling of being needed by my neighbor and just being able, them being able to call me, me getting somebody out of a bind. Like I love, like I said, going back to, I like being appreciated. I like being helpful and it's just being a good person. I, I have the flexibility to help people in a tough spot, and I love doing it. That's really what it's all about. Because you know, life's life. I'm not going to be here for a short amount of time. I want to leave the world just a little bit better than when I got here. Well, Ed, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's a beautiful way to end. Ed Saul of Ed Saul Crafts. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was I had an absolutely fantastic time. It was great uh, talking to you. Uh, my pleasure. It was my pleasure speaking with you, sir. Take care. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Saul of Ed Saul Crafts. Um, uh, I'm really a big fan of his collaboration knife and his hunting knife that I left right over there. Um, I do look forward to checking out more of his stuff in the future. Um, and be sure to, to check out episode, I think it was, I should have asked him, uh, season eight, episode nine or season nine, episode eight. I can't remember. Look at them both. I'm sure they're both awesome. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.